Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is the uh, 28th of March, uh, March uh, 2014 version of my video blog. I guess I'm getting kind of optimistic that I'll keep on doing this for uh, for years to come. Uh, so let's start with what I've been up to over the last week. Last Friday, after I recorded uh, the last version of this, I went to a, a bad movie meetup and saw two films, one of which was Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, which felt a lot like a trauma film. I don't know if, if you if you're familiar with trauma films. Trauma is a film uh, film studio, I think studio that uh, makes intentionally bad, over the top, campy, ultra violence, cheesy movies. They made Tromeo and Juliet, which was actually almost good. Class of Nukem Nukem High, Toxic Avenger. That that's a series. Uh, um, Attack, I think, of the Killer Condoms, all sorts of amazingly bad films that are meant to be kind of fun to watch. And I had, some co uh, I had a college roommate, actually a few college roommates who liked to watch them. One of them was really into them and had a uh, big collection of them. The, uh, the rest of us just kind of sat along and enjoyed the entertainment. Um, so Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter kind of felt like one of those, just like it, it's really it doesn't mind being cheesy. It celebrates being cheesy. It's not trying to be a good film. And it was kind of entertaining. And then after that, we saw a film called uh, The Room. And The Room had this guy with an excruciatingly terrible accent um, who was meant to be a good-natured guy who is betrayed by all of his friends and commits suicide. Uh, sorry if I'm spoiling it. You do not want to see this film. Um, but just the guy was so irritating and sleazy and stuff that I think I, I, I wasn't really rooting against him, but it was impossible to root for him. Uh, it also had the production quality of really bad porn. And I haven't seen a lot of porn in my life. I, I mean, like his films or anything like that. But wow, this was such a stinker. Um, but it was kind of fun to watch, although admittedly near... About halfway through it, I really had had enough, and I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to stay or just head on home. Um, I stayed, but I don't think I really... That was... The, the film had so many pointless scenes in it. I don't know. Some of the dialogue was so bad, it was quotable. Um, the next day, uh, last Saturday, I went to a all-day... Well, really, it was more like a five-hour... Uh, climate day course at the American Museum of Natural History, where we learned about um, current developments in climate science, how to communicate the findings of climate science to the broad public, and um, and learned about specific topics in, in climate change. Now, as I see it, climate change, it's, it's a fact. It's a very well-established fact. It shouldn't be seen as controversial. It's not scientifically controversial. Humans have created climate change. It poses a danger to our long-term uh, long uh, existence on the planet. It's going to have a lot of bad effects. And unless we start changing the, uh, our development uh, habits, which is going to be pretty rough because we're used to nice lifestyles, um, unless we make some big changes, we're going to have some bigger problems down the road. Even if we do make changes, we're still going to have some big problems down the road. But if we don't stop, then we're kind of screwed. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the problems with having a society with a, with a plurality of views and a lot of uneducated people is that people who have a financial interest in delaying our, our change or causing it never to happen uh, delaying our changes to how we conduct business in the country, as well as people who just have a whole flat-out objection to any type of coordinated societal responses to any challenges. Um, they can put out a lot of disinformation and convince people, oh, well, there, there are two sides to this issue, so we don't really need to do anything about it until everybody agrees, and they can prevent everybody from ever agreeing. Even if the experts, the people who know the most about it, are already in a pretty solid agreement, um, it means that we're going to have a tough time reaching consensus, which isn't good. 
So trying to find ways to better uh, convince people that this is a problem and we should be dealing with it is important. And also the American Museum of Natural History is just it's a good place to, uh, to hang out if you like academic topics, if you like being in a place of learning. So I went to that, I enjoyed it. Uh, so last Sunday, I went to, uh, I hung out with a friend. We were meaning to go to the Neue Gallery, uh, but it turns out that there was a huge line. So we went to the Guggenheim instead and uh, saw again the Italian Futurism uh, exhibit, which was neat. Um, I have some interesting political issues with, with Futurism as a past political movement, but I think I probably have already talked about that on Google Plus. If you're interested, just go see what I wrote there. Uh, there's no real need to reiterate my, my thoughts on that. But it was neat seeing it. It was neat hanging out with a friend. Um, we swung by the uh, the Neue Gallery afterwards, but there was still a really long line. But it's a, uh, but the Neue Gallery's exhibit is is new, and we might uh, swing by, uh, try to swing by again later when maybe the line has died down a bit, maybe in a few weeks. Uh, this Monday, I went to a philosophy meetup on whether languages exist. Um, this is, so I initially thought that this wasn't going to be a particularly interesting topic because it all hinges on what it means for something to exist. Um, are you a Platonist uh, in the sense that you think that abstract concepts exist in some meaningful sense? Um, are you more of a... Uh, more of a materialist, where you think that physical objects are what exists, or are you something in between? I, I lean very strongly towards, uh, towards being a materialist in the sense of philosophical materialist. But to my surprise, some of the other people there wanted to have a more complicated notion of existence that ad admits the idea that numbers exist, that abstract patterns exist in, in a meaningful sense. And so there was a lot of interesting back and forth over those basic questions of uh, epistemology, of definitions, of how do, what does it mean for something to exist. Um, good conversation. And I, I guess that's one of the things that I've, I've gotten used to with, uh, with that particular group, and that even if I think that the basic topic is uninteresting, we're probably going to have a neat conversation. Um, on Tuesday, I had a terrible migraine that consumed most of the day. Actually, I actually have a mild one right now. Uh, this is a health problem that I've had for most of my life. Uh, I have migraines that range from terrible to, uh, to just painful, and happens maybe once a week. Uh, and they tend to disrupt my social life and occasionally disrupt uh, occasionally disrupts uh, my job, uh, my employment life, but you deal with it, or at least I deal with it. It's it's not pleasant, but nobody's body body is perfect. We all have quirks, and some of the quirks take a while to, uh, to show up. I do have some medication that helps a little bit. Um, doesn't reliably help, though, and it didn't really help uh, on Tuesday. It's a pity. I actually had a ticket um, to go to another American Museum of Natural History event that afternoon, but I just wasn't feeling up to it. On Wednesday, I went to a, a lecture at the American Museum of Natural History on, um, on uh, there's a set of, uh, of books in like, I think the 18th century. Oh, well, I guess it's easier actually. I happen to have this prop handy. Uh, so there's a natural histories book that was put together by this guy, uh, Tom Bayon. Uh, which is, uh, there's a set of plates that people did when they were just starting to understand, um, when they were just starting to classify uh, biology, uh, classify uh, critters and places. And you had people making, uh, making plates of, of these paintings and reproducing them and sending them out to people who would subscribe to uh, these weekly or monthly publications. And they would eventually take these things to their local binder, 
bind them into beautiful books. And so this was kind of a, a, a presentation on the history of that movement. And of course, there was a book signing. Um, really cool, neat stuff. Uh, and you, you just you wouldn't know that these types of social scientific arrangements that they existed unless you uh, read one of these books or um, or were a scholar just happened to be interested in old technologies. But it was neat to see. Uh, so this was actually the, the the second lecture that I went to on this, and that I have a rather nice uh, level of membership at the American Museum of Natural History. And a few months ago, they did a first presentation of some of this material to for some of the upper le uh, levels uh, levels of membership, and that was really cool. But they covered a slightly different set of topics. There was a lot of over, uh, overlap, but uh, or with with this lecture and the previous one, but it was quite cool. Um, and then yesterday, I went to a legal hackers meetup. And by legal hackers, this just means people are interested in using the mechanics of law uh, or using the mechanism of law uh, and policy to create good social ends. And so it's generally a group of young, change-oriented lawyers. Not all young, though. You end up having a fair number of law professors as well. And the topic this time uh, was the, the practical implications of equity and non-equity crowdfunding. And just because equity is a term that you might not already know, equity is a stake in a company, like a share, uh, like partial ownership. And so when you're buying equity in a company or otherwise attaining it, you, you have stock, you have a share in the profits, you might have a share in the, deci in the decision making. And so by, by crowdfunding, we're talking about reaching out to random people well, not random people, but generally members of the general public and asking them to fund a company, either in an equity sense, in which case they're, they're buying partial ownership in it, or non-equity, where you have things like Kickstarter. And actually, Kickstarter's general counsel uh, was there, which made it pretty interesting, um, where you have more of a project-oriented funding, like, uh, uh, I mean, Patreon is another example, where you have an album, you have a, a device or something, and you have people uh, signing up to, to receive the device if enough people uh, fund its creation. And so the discussion was on uh, whether, uh, or uh, was on the, the legal, uh, the, the way that the law treats these different types of crowdfunding, because there's a lot of existing legal uh, mechanisms for how uh, mechanisms for how uh, how young companies get their get their money to run things before they become profitable, or even after they've become profitable, if they need enough capital to invest in something that theoretically will get them a lot more capital. You you could go through a bank, but banks often are wary of very speculative investment for good reason. I mean, even uh, merchant banks and other banks that focus on business oriented loans. They typically don't want to be one of the first people to invest in your company. They'd like to see it more proven. So you end up having um, uh, venture capitalists, uh, angel investors, and a whole, whole bunch of other means to get your initial funds for your company when it's, uh, when it's young. And so there was kind of a discussion of how the existing securities laws work with regards to this, how some recent changes have uh, are changing the uh, are altering the landscape. Some recent legal changes are altering the investment landscape, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. Uh, so generally, companies rarely mix both equity and non-equity crowdfunding, and but there is they do influence each other because if you can get enough funding for your business idea. Um, as a company, then you can often demonstrate to the larger scale investors, look, this isn't a, we're not just inventing a completely made up uh, market for this. There are people who are interested in what we're doing. Maybe you should invest in us. So pretty cool. Um, I mean, uh, another way, I guess in, in the broader sense, you often end up having startups that demonstrate the potential in an idea, and then existing larger companies will buy them up um, 
or they'll they'll do their own investment to get involved in it uh, in a market. Like take three D printing, you end up ended up having a lot of uh, a lot of really little companies starting up to start to fulfill um, uh, to start to uh, to fill the market needs there. And now you're starting to see companies like uh, Hewlett Packard um, announce plans to get involved in, in 3D printing because it's been demonstrated enough that it's now not just a, a big risk. And the original IBM PC, it followed um, at least uh, five or six years of the hobbyist computer uh, scene, um, like the Apple II, uh, or I mean the Apple I, the Apple II, a, a lot of the early um, computing devices, uh, I mean personal computing devices, they came as, as kits and people would assemble these, they would uh, share software on bulletin boards, and they demonstrated the potential for not quite average people, but for for general uh, general people to to get use out of a computer in the home, and so and so IBM and and a few other companies they saw the potential in this and they thought maybe we should get involved, and they made their own hobbyist computers that weren't really for hobbyists in the sense that you don't you didn't do that much assembly of them. You would buy a, a completed board and drop RAM onto it and stuff like that. But um, but it it took an existing proto market and made it into a market where you didn't have to have much uh, so much expertise. I mean you still had to learn how to use DOS or CPM uh, or Xenix uh, to run uh, to, to use one of the original PCs, but it's more of a demonstrated market. They civilized it to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, that, that was interesting. Uh, and today, well, I just woke up with a mild to moderate migraine, which I still have right now. Okay. But um, So that's, that's what I have been up to. Recently, I, I was excited to find that Vienna Tang who's a musician who I particularly like. She currently, sometime over the last few months, released an album called Ames. And Vienna Tang, she's a, a vocalist. Uh, she's also an engineer. Uh, I mean, like, not, not a musical engineer, but a, a proper engineer. Um, but she, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to describe her music. It's... Um, yeah, it, strong vocals, typically a slightly folksy uh, feel to it. Not not very folksy though. She and she ends up talking about a lot of. Um, well, I mean, I guess a lot of music is about this, but relationships and shapes of of how we live life. Uh, paints a picture of, of the character with ambitions uh, and difficulties. Uh, um, but this new album is much more adventurous in the types of musical content that it, it digs into. And it does surprisingly well at that. Um, there are musicians where I like a lot of their stuff, but the, the hit rate, that is how, how much of, the, of their music that they produce that I like is not particularly high. Like, take Dar Williams. She's probably my favorite musician. Um, she has come up with a lot of really great songs and a lot of really good songs, but there are also a fair number of her songs that just aren't my taste. And so her hit rate for me is probably about 50%, like about half her songs, which is quite good. Um, most most uh, music groups or musicians, I might like about 15, 20% of their songs. Liking about half of her songs means that uh, and and liking the ones that I, I really like a hell of a lot. Um, I mean, it, it makes it easy for me to say that she's my favorite musician. Uh, they Might Be Giants is another good example of, of, of a music group where the songs that they make that I really like, I really, really like. But for me, their hit rate is probably around 40%. Uh, most, uh, a little bit over half of their songs are just not to my taste. Um, compare that with uh, like Vienna Tang and Firewander, uh, where I like almost all of their songs quite a lot. 
And they do have some of those songs where I just think they're absolutely fantastic. And I was surprised that Deanna Tang ma made an album that was so experimental in style, where I still like uh, liked basically every song on the album. I guess uh, Firewater, uh, they had a song called, um, oh shoot, what's, what's it called? Uh, I guess I can look it up. Something orange. Uh, International Orange. Uh, that album, there's only one. Uh, there's only one song on it where I'm kind of mad, and it has some amazingly good good music in it. At least by my tastes, I kind of like. Uh, so Firewater has kind of this Baltic um, fusion uh, mix feel to it. It's uh, it, it has very diverse influences little bit of, of Romani flavoring. Uh, it's lots of really interesting beats. Uh, it's, whereas, I, I mean, it, it's very, it's still very different from Vienna Tang, where uh, her music is much more vocally centric, much more conceptually driven. Um, with Firewater, you're not really, I mean, the, the lyrics in the Firewater songs are clever, but they're not, uh, it's not painting a story for you in the way that uh, Vienna Tang's songs are. But in any case, yeah, it's, it's great to have that. I, I subscribe to the Google Play Music uh, service, and that's how I get most of my music. I still have to upload uh, some things that aren't available on there. But it's, uh, but yeah, it was definitely a, a big win as a fund. Um, So when it comes to when it comes to uh, other things that that, that I'm uh, I'm doing, let's see. Job wise, I'm expecting to start to interview with uh, with a few companies uh, soon. Um, making a little bit of progress there. There are a few. Uh, I, I guess I, I do need to figure out the health insurance thing. Um, pretty soon because I'm, I think the end of my old health insurance from my past job, it's coming up really soon now if it's not already passed. And it's one of the things I've really learned in life, at least in the United States, you do not want to be without health insurance for very long because you can easily lose all of your savings, uh, just with one illness. Um, it's one of the deficiencies of, uh, life in the United States particularly given how many people are uninsured. But yeah, I, I need to get some type of temporary insurance for now until I get the next job lined up. But I'm going to figure that out today. Um, I'm heading out to a coffee shop after I finish this up. And I have that and a, a few other things to, uh, to get together. My work on the educational videos is coming along nicely. I'm doing large-scale revisions to a lot of my class content right now. Um, I do need to to get back and uh, and do new recordings uh, soon, since that's really one of the best measures of how how far along I'm coming with this. Uh, it's it's too easy to convince myself that I'm making progress, even when I can see the changes to the course materials. If if I'm not actually making it concrete by either teaching people or doing new recordings, so. I'm hoping probably tomorrow, and although I'm thinking about making a day trip down to Philadelphia tomorrow, but sometime this weekend I'm going to be doing uh, new recordings. Um, I'm also doing a let's play of uh, a Fallout 3, which is a lot of fun, um, although I, I keep forgetting how long a game Fallout 3 is, but um, it's... I think I have like seven or eight videos up on YouTube right now that I've pulled together so far. They're about an hour apiece. I don't know how good they are, but I, I'm i hoping that it's entertaining for people to watch Fallout 3 and to listen to me babble most of the way through. Um, I've known that I, I enjoy watching some Let's Plays that other people are doing. I'm not sure if I'm as funny as the people who uh, whose Let's Plays I, I enjoy. Like, I, I like, uh, there's a 
um, somebody who does uh, uh, a video blog uh, who talks about the gaming industry, and she occasionally does uh, Let's Plays. Uh, her name's Dodger, and I like uh, her videos. There's also a um, there are also a few other um, Let's Play producers. There was one of the two or three people who who go by the same name of the angry video game nerd. There was a guy by the name of uh, uh, who had the the handle of Isfawful. Um, I know that he's not he's probably not the most commonly known person going under the ABGN moniker. There's another guy who I find intensely irritating who also goes by that name, and I guess there's a certain contention between them over who picked the name first. But anyhow, Isfawful's uh, uh, Let's Plays were always entertaining, uh, but I'm not sure if, if mine are that good, but I'm, I'm having a good time making them, and as long as YouTube is happy to host them, uh, I'm happy to put them up. And it, it also helps me to skin the, the habit of, of producing things a little bit more frequently, which I think is a good habit to be in. Um, let's see, what, what else is there? To, uh, so politics continue to be interesting. Uh, so in the United States, there's generally this, uh, because uh, most Americans are not particularly politically aware, don't follow foreign politics, and get their news sources from the same place, there's a general agreement on how to parse uh, first foreign uh, news. And I admittedly on, on this particular issue have a reasonably American perspective, uh, that is Russia's occupation of Crimea. But one of the interesting things about being, being on Google Plus and in particular being active on, uh, on Al Jazeera's uh, news, uh, news feeds is that I bump into a lot of people who who come at international politics from a very different place, and I get into arguments with them, um, of course. Uh, and so there's, we occasionally have very spicy discussions on how to parse things, including this. Uh, my perspective is that, uh, is that Crimea is part of the Ukraine, uh, is, uh, is that the Ukraine would have to, as a nation, decide to let go of Crimea um, before it could declare independence or be absorbed by Russia. And so I see the Russian uh, annexation as illegitimate and as an unacceptable land grab. And I th uh, there are some arguments against that that have been made. Um, some people would argue that Crimea uh, should have uh, self-determination. I don't think it should because it's a subnational unit. And I think that basically you could take any nation and if you were to, to carve, uh, if you were to gerrymander or carve portions of it correctly, you could find uh, bits of it, contiguous bits of it that would like to break away. Um, if you have a lot of uh, immigration, say, from France into a particular neighborhood in the United States, and then you decide, oh, you know what, you can have a vote and decide to make your neighborhood part of France, you could probably find ways to carve up um, nations uh, where most of their territory, or at least much of it, would have to be given away to other nations because local people have voted. And I don't think that that's really a workable way to, uh, it's not a workable norm. And so I, I don't find the argument that uh, of regional self-determination to be convincing, uh, either to let them become independent nations or to uh, let them be swallowed by other nations where they might want uh, some affiliation. If you want to be part of another nation, you can leave and go join that other nation. You can probably even bring most of your stuff with you, but you don't get to bring the land that you're on with you when you uh, when you change your national affiliation. So, yeah, I just I don't think that the the people who are sympathetic to the Russian side of things have a leg to stand on. Other people, of course, disagree, and we'll have arguments, and hopefully the back and forth will result in helpful changes in, in perspective, or at least an understanding between these perspectives. And that's really one of the big changes that I think 
having international news media and international fora uh, will, will give us uh, as a species. We won't all be living in national news bubbles where everybody parses things the same way. And it's my hope that at least uh, this greater amount of discussion will lead to more interesting uh, conclusions and maybe better thought conclusions. And the slaughter continues in Syria. Uh, not a lot's going to happen there because the world is too busy worrying about the Ukraine and uh, generally we're not willing to do anything to prevent uh, a dictator from killing uh, from killing people, which is a damn shame. <sighs> but I guess people are too tired of conflict to prevent ongoing atrocities. Um, not a lot else is going on in world politics, or at least not a lot, a lot else of, of that level of interestingness. I, so the new version of the Oculus Rift uh, development kit uh, has been announced. People can pre-order it. I'm not sure when it's actually going to arrive. Um, but uh, there, there are, uh, there's somebody in my family who's interested in doing telepresence experiments, and I'm probably going to, to help him with that. So. We got on the pre-order list for for that, and I don't know when it's. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see when it arrives, how immersive it is, what what's supported with it, what kind of uh, APIs and SDKs are provided. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to tinkering with that. Um, I've been looking into the uh, Intel, uh, what's it called, the computational unit, the. Well, Intel has put together a platform uh, of the small uh, for small units of computing, basically very small form factor, minimal PCs that uh, that you can use for a variety of hobbyist purposes. I guess this is meant to compete with the somewhat higher end versions of projects that people are using Raspberry Pis for right now, and uh, I think they cost around one hundred fifty. And they're, they're, they're like yay big, I think. And uh, I've been thinking about getting one, uh, several of those for, uh, they are PC compatible, uh, for one of the platforms for uh, cloud computing research uh, that, I'm, uh, that I would be getting involved in. Um, this is something which I would have to wait until I'm employed again to really feel comfortable buying, but uh, it, uh, it's, it's neat to see more effort coming uh, coming into uh, uh, low cost computing, even lower capability computing. We for for so long decided that the only PCs worth making are the big expensive ones, but uh, I guess in recent years we've been exploring much lower cost devices. The Chromebook is a great example of that. Um, and having that extend into the desktop type computing, it's it's a good trend, and I I expect it to continue. In a few months, I think uh, Disgaea uh, Four, which is a game that I've been looking forward to, uh, should be coming to the PS Vita, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and I expect at some point uh, Disgaea D2, which is a direct sequel to Disgaea, uh, or is it D? Yeah, I think it's D2, which is a direct sequel to Disgaea 1 with the same characters, uh, or roughly the same characters. I imagine it will be coming out for the Vita, just because it would make sense with uh, Nipponichi's uh, um, development habits. I guess that's not really a great word. With their, uh, they they have a pattern of initially re uh, releasing things for a console gaming system, and then eventually releasing uh, the same game later with a lot of add-ons for a portable platform like the Vita. So I expect uh, D2 will eventually make its way to the Vita as well. I'm not sure how much uh, DLC has been released for uh, for D2, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, Let's see. Well, 
Well, I think that's that's probably pretty much it. Uh, I, I have been enjoying reading. Uh, I, I got the I got the art book. Well, I, I guess the exhibit book for the Italian Futurism uh, uh, exhibit at uh, at the Guggenheim, and I've been enjoying reading through that. But there's a triptych that I particularly like uh, in, uh, in that that uh, took me a while to uh, to find. Um, basically, I, I learned that if you translate the title of a work of art, most people won't, uh, yeah, you're going to have a very tough time finding it uh, by the translated title. And uh, it took me some time to, to find that, uh, that triptych online. Um, yeah, but I, I've already written about that on Google+. Uh, so it's, it's nice actually having the uh, having uh, warmer weather slowly arriving. It's for March. It's not nearly as warm as I would expect it to be in New York, but I'm hoping that we start to see much warmer weather soon. Um, but yep, I I guess that's pretty much it for now. I'm I'm probably going to be heading over to Key Lounge up in Park Slope, which is one of my favorite places to hang out uh, and just get stuff done. One of the things that uh, surprises me about New York is that there are a lot of absolutely huge coffee shops. And for for a city that values real estate so highly, you might not expect that. Although I guess what you one argument for that is that everybody's apartment is so small that you need to have people have a uh, have a place to socialize outside of their home, or at least to have options for that. And so having big coffee shops makes sense. And they're not that much more expensive than coffee shops in smaller cities, but um, but still, you you might not expect uh, that kind of thing uh, in such a spaces at a premium type city. But oh well. Uh, so I'm gonna sign off here. I will see you next week. Um, take care.